Um, our next speaker, um, Gene Farber, has presented already this week. He's the um, Chief Operating Officer at Reliance ACO. He's in charge of overseeing the day-to-day -day running of the ACO, which has grown from 14,000 beneficiaries to, in 2014 to over 37,000 beneficiaries in 2017. He led the effort to form a new, uh, a new next generation ACO, Reliance Next Gen ACO, which was accepted into the program in 2018. In the public sector, Mr. Farber has served as an elected member of the West Bloomfield, Michigan Township Board Chairman of the Planning Commission and was appointed by Governor Jennifer Granholm as a public member of the State of Michigan Oil and Gas Advisory Board from 2004 to 2016. Mr. Farber received his law degree from the University of Michigan. And just like Ed, I began working with Gene in 2014. I think um, more than any other single stakeholder, you have as much to do with ADT conformance as anybody. Um, Reliance was the first people who were really diving into the data and really you know, paying attention and say, hey, we can't tell consistently if this is inpatient or outpatient. And, and they were diving into the data. And so I um, really appreciate the, the things you've helped my hand be able to accomplish. Let's give a welcome to Gene Farber. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> as he indicated, I'm Gene Farber. I'm CEO of <clears throat> Reliance ACL, we're based in Farmington Hills, Michigan. I'm not a tech person, so I am going to give a non-technical explanation of what we're doing, um, how we're using uh, Myhin in our everyday operations, and how Salesforce has come into it. Um, I think some background is really necessary to understand. As indicated, we started in 2014 as a physician-owned, physician-operated, physician-run, except for me, who's a lawyer, um, ACL. Uh, we had about 100 doctors and 14,000 Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, the kind of significance of this is we self-funded. And the way the shared savings program goes, if you save money during the calendar year, then they will tell you July of the following year if you were successful. So we're still waiting for 2017. And they will send you a check in either October or November, which means you have to have enough funds to go for 23 months, which in turn means you have to be very careful on how you spend the money. Unlike um, a hospital system that if they do billions of dollars in revenue, uh, $10,000 probably doesn't matter. Every penny mattered to us when we started. Uh, we've grown to the point where we have the two ACOs. We're starting a third next year. We'll probably have about 50,000 beneficiaries in five counties, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, St. Clair, and Monroe. Um, when we first received the contract from Medicare, they award you the contract, they were late that year, about December 10th. And then on December 29th, they dumped 14,000 names and doctors in text files, and that was it. That was all of the information that we were given. So we basically converted those into Excel files so we could at least read them. Uh, we didn't have any addresses, we didn't have any phone numbers, we had to scramble to get the doctor's offices to give us those. We had no integrated system when we started. Uh, we had a contract with a large national company that said they had worked with ACOs, and by March 1st they told us they thought they'd have the system up and running by August. This obviously created a problem for us because the year would have been two-thirds over. So I terminated that contract and uh, we looked at other sources. Um, at the same time this was going on, we were getting on more of an anecdotal basis when our patients went to the hospital. If they called their doctor before they went or if one of their family members called. 
we tried to have some of our doctors who rounded see these patients. This was spectacularly unsuccessful. So at that point, our CEO, Dr. Nazmal Haq, remembered that when he was uh, part of the first iteration of ACOs called Pioneer ACOs were done through the DMC in Detroit at that time. Uh, when he met in Washington, he was impressed by the health information exchange that the state of Massachusetts had. So he determined to look up if we had something in Michigan because at that point there was, it was hospital based really, there was no communications with the POs or certainly not with the ACOs. And because we were so small, uh, we were told to go through another group and we chose SEMI. Helen Hill was our contact there and Helen was a lifesaver. Uh, she got us up and running and working with MyHan and finally, finally we were getting information. But the question was, okay, we now have these HL7 feeds. The HL7 feed has a series of columns. The first column has the name and then the address, et cetera, and it is readable if you go through line by line, but it's not really usable. So we had um, looked at some off-the-shelf products that will translate it um, and didn't really think that would do it for the ACL. We had had some contact with a vendor that was marketing to ACOs called Synaptic Advisory Partners. They're out of Baltimore. We had had a couple of conversations and we brought them in and our CEO said, you have three weeks to get this system up and running and fully integrated with MyHin and we'll pay you. If you don't meet the deadline, you don't have the contract. And by God, they did it. And suddenly we're getting information that we could use. That was my first introduction to Salesforce. As I said, I'm not a tech person. I had never heard of Salesforce, quite frankly, before we met with them. Um, basically, we're setting up through Synapse our own database in-house. And through Semi, we're subscribing to MyHin and we're getting data from MyHin. And as I indicated, the messages are not really readable, so they have to be converted. And Salesforce is very good at integrating seamlessly from my hand using Synapse to give us a form that we can use. Uh, all the lines are broken out into usable stuff, so we have columns for the basic things like name, address, phone number, also the doctor also the group and anything else that we want to, whether it's the uh, patient identifier number or other things, we can set that up. It gives us the ability to build any kind of report that we need, which is very important because a lot of times we don't know what we're gonna wanna look at. And you've gotta be able not to have just off the shelf reports, if you get that, that's great for a while, but it doesn't always work in the long run. Now, there were other products out there that vendors use, certainly Microsoft and Amazon, and many other vendors have similar things to Salesforce, but their interface between the data and the user was much easier. And I don't know a lot about interfaces, I just know that anytime we try to do it, somebody has a problem with it and it takes about twice as long as they promise us. So the ease of use was really, really important to us. Um, Salesforce also has excellent security. Now we're, we're dealing with PHI, that is absolutely critical. Everybody hears all the time about data breaches, um, especially at our level. We can't do anything about it, we just have to choose the best vendor and we've done that, we believe, by using the Salesforce platform. Um, in addition, it's reliable. According to their statistics, they're up 99.98% of the time. I don't know if that's true. I just know that while our server has gone down sometimes, we have pretty good reliability. We've never had a problem where the Salesforce part of it has broken down. It also can be changed easily. The kinds of 
things that we were doing when we had 10,000 beneficiaries as opposed to 40,000 has changed drastically over the years. And we've been able to use the same system um, and improve it without having to bring in a new vendor. So Synapse got us up and running and we received the HL7 feeds. Now, one of the important things that we had to do was figure out what they really meant. I looked this morning before I came in. Yesterday, we received a total of 4,633 messages from my end. Um, this included everything, so there had to be a way to sort those. Of those messages, over 900 said either admission, transfer, and discharge. But again, that's not sufficient because if somebody goes into a hospital for a blood test, some of the hospitals treat that as an admission and will code it to my hint as an admission. And when you finish the blood test, it's coded as a discharge from the hospital. It's not a true discharge. So you have to go in and look at some of the other codes that are in there in order to filter it out. It was not an easy process. Um, we continually look at it to try to improve it, but it works most of the time on a very, very large volume. So now that we had it and we have a system, um, the kind of topic I wanted to talk is how we use this in our risk management. So one of the things we do is we monitor the HL7 feeds from 7 a.m. in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday, and on Saturdays from 9 to 1. And any time one of our patients in the ACO hits the hospital, we're notified. If, if you recall the last um, slide that was shown up there showed how it went to the hospital and then went to Myhin. Well, Myhin has a list of our patients that we upload monthly and if it matches on the patient list, then we get the notification. And that's, that's how it works. It's, from our point of view, as simple as that. So it allows us to call the hospitals and find out if it's a serious condition and not serious condition, and if some, the patient can be discharged or if they have to be kept for a long-term stay or if they can go to observation. Um, another part of this, which really doesn't have to do with uh, MyHen or Salesforce, is that it's, we have spent a great deal of time working with the hospitals so that when we call, they will take the call and they will take the information. Um, some of the hospitals will allow us to upload our patient list to match it, and they've identified our patients in their system so that when we call, they will uh, understand that it's one of our patients. Now, does this work 100% of the time? No. Are there some doctors when we call say, we don't care who you are and hang up on us? Yes, that's the real world. But after five years, we have a lot more cooperation than when we started. Um, we've also used it in terms long-term for risk management. Now, there's a lot of different theories on how you risk stratify the patients. Um, a lot of the literature looks at the HCC codes or the risk factors. We ran those against our actual hospitalizations and did not find a good correlation. Uh, I have a relative who had a heart attack, has high blood pressure, has diabetes. Tremendously high risk score, takes all of the medication as prescribed and hasn't been in the hospital in 10 years. He is a high risk patient under the risk score. He's not a high risk patient in terms of probably going back to the hospital. Um, so we did not find that useful. Several other programs offer very complex algorithms that they swear they can predict um, who's going to go back into the hospital? Um, I would suggest that most of these people exaggerate to some extent or another. Um, 
none of us has seen a substantial decrease in our health insurance premiums or our health insurance costs over the last five years, unless there's anybody here, raise your hand. But uh, as a practical matter, these programs aren't, can't predict 90% of the time or 80% of the time, or if they did, we would really see a substantial drop in the number of unnecessary hospitalizations. What we found was um, looking at cost alone also didn't work. A person could be in once for a heart uh, surgery, very expensive. They recover, they're never going back, hopefully. A person could have knee replacements, also expensive, but something that is not repeating. We found, at least in our group, that a very simple correlation of if a patient is in the hospital three times in a year, they're probably gonna continue going, or two times in six months, you've got a patient with a problem. I know it's simple, I know it doesn't meet all of the algorithms, but by God, it's been effective. So that kind of loops back to my hand, because if we waited for the claims information, it's too late. We received claims information approximately 90 days late. Um, hospitals and doctors have, the, in their normal cycle, often take that long. So we rely on the ADTs to know when the patients are in the hospital. And our program now automatically will um, select a patient who has met this criteria and send an alert that this patient is what we call a tier three patient or a complex care patient. And we don't have to wait till we get the claims at the end of the month. If somebody is, uh, goes in in January and we get that claim in April and they go in in February and we get an ADT and they go in again in March, based on the ADTs without having to wait the claims uh, that we're getting from my hen, we will automatically make that patient a tier three patient. We also do, however, compare it against the claims because as noted previously, some of the people will go into a hospital in another state. Especially, we have a large number of snowbirds. Um, we don't have any interface with Florida, so we can't ever get those claims. And there's always a matching problem that we're gonna have until we get a universal identifier, that if the hospital puts in a middle initial and the patient according to Medicare, doesn't have a middle initial or vice versa, we're not gonna get a match. So we get about 70% of all um, hospital admissions and discharges are, will correlate with my end. 10%, there's absolutely nothing we can do about. The other 20%, we keep working with my hand and seeing if we can improve the matching function over time. All of these complex patients of ours are assigned to care coordinators. These are nurses. They will call the patients on a monthly basis. If the patient is having an unusual problem, then we will send out a nurse. Uh, if a patient needs to see a doctor but does not have transportation, we have a contract with Lyft. Uh, we'll send a Lyft to their house and take them to the doctor. If it appears that uh, they really do need to go to the emergency room, then we will call 911 for them, but we'll also notify our ED department to notify the hospital that a patient is coming in and uh, to, that it's a Reliance patient and see if you can stabilize them. Um, uh, there are times also when the care coordinators will call the doctor's office if the patient has been having problems getting through. Uh, sometimes, although we do our best, some of the doctor's offices, the front desk, do not recognize when a patient really has a serious problem and has to be seen as opposed to a routine exam. So we, at the ACO level, work with the doctors to try to point out if a tier three patient calls, they probably have a problem and you've probably, you should get them in the same day. 
Again, that's an education and a learning process. Um, we are using Myhin and the HL7 feeds more. There, there's the med reconciliation, which we're trying to fully integrate, and frankly, we're not there yet, but we will we'll get there. Um, there's also from outside sources um, quite a bit lab tests are can routinely be loaded into the system That's one of the advantages of Salesforce. It can take it in Integrate it with the rest of the stuff. I don't know how but it it appears uh, so that gives us a more complete picture um, the other thing we're doing is trying to get the information from the doctors, EHRs, and EMRs. We still have about 35% of our doctors that are on paper only. And um, despite our best efforts, especially if it's a doctor who's been around a lot of years, they do not believe it's worth the time and the effort. And frankly, it may not be worth it for them. Uh, but the other 60 to 70%, we've been working to be able to get their information into our system. On the ones that we can't, we still have, uh, on most of them, a read-only access. So it not only allows us to do all of the quality measures uh, that CMS requires and all the insurers, frankly, require, uh, but it also allows us to see if anything comes up on an office visit that we should be aware of uh, that didn't appear in a hospital claim or an outside claim. So those are kind of the ways that uh, we have been using MyHin and Salesforce together um, to work on the risk management. Um, the other thing that I think sometimes gets forgotten in all of this is it's really critical who's on your team in terms of doing any of this. Um, there are lots of groups that get feeds from my hint at the present time, and there are lots of, of groups that receive ADTs and are notified of discharges and admissions. If you don't have people to do anything with it, it doesn't mean anything. If you don't have people that are really, really good and know what they're doing, it doesn't mean anything. And I think as we go more and more technology have more technology doing some of these things. We forget that at the end of the day, in, in healthcare at least, it's still people that make the difference. Uh, we need good people in data, we need good nurses, we need good care coordinators, we need good doctors. And if we don't have that, the best technology in the world is not gonna solve the problem. Um, that's basically what we're doing. Uh, with Salesforce and Myhin, are there any questions? Um, you mentioned looking at hospitalizations and that cutoff to identify high-risk patients. Are you doing something similar just for ED visits, or are you kind of grouping those together? Um, we have not group the ED separately, we were not able to find enough of a correlation. I'm not saying that there probably is a, a way to do that. We just found that the hospitalization itself, um, because in terms of a hospitalization is about 40% of all of the costs. And while ED admissions, um, unnecessary people going to the ED, is, is something that is talked about a lot. It's normally about 600 to $1,000. And I'm not denigrating that cost, but the hospitalizations now are over $11,000. So somebody can go to the ER 10 times and that gets a lot of publicity. That's less than one unnecessary hospitalization. So no, we have not put extra emphasis on the ED visits unless they're followed up by a hospitalization. Uh, hey, Gene. Um, Mike Leeson, United Physicians. Um, question for you is one of the things, that, one of the challenges that we've recently presented with ADTs is observation patients. 
right. and their movement from inpatient classifications to outpatient classifications. Have you guys spent any time focusing on that population? We spend all of our time focusing on that population. Our biggest fight with the hospital is to um, patients who are appropriate to observation to get them into observation. That is the main emphasis of what our, our ED people are, uh, the nurse practitioners that we have 16 hours a day do. Um, it's also the, the biggest pushback because as, um, when I was at the ACO conference, the president of Trinity said, they're taking up space and I'm giving them the same service and I'm getting a third of the money, so I want them to be a full admit. Um, that it's, it, it, um, if they meet the criteria that they can stay in observation, we want them in observation if they can safely be there. We want them to start an observation. If they're really sick and they need to be upgraded, then upgrade them. Um, the biggest problem that we have is the hospitals don't really uniformly code what is observation. So, uh, you know, I know 60 is, is a hospital admission and what 10, 20, 30, 40 are in terms of, of the coding. There is no uniform way for observation, and, and the toughest thing for us is to determine what the percentage of observation actually is, um, because those are the, that would, you know, we're kind of guessing at it. We're, we're doing a better job now. We think it should be about 30 percent. That's the national average, and we think Michigan, at least in our experience, has been somewhat lower. Um, so we keep pushing that. But that's a matter of the hospitals pushing back, and there's no uniform way for the hospitals that always say this patient is an observation. Um, and that's frankly the single biggest frustration we face. Any other questions? So obviously, the ADTs, the ADT feeds is what's going. It, mainly into Salesforce, and you said it's integrated with some other systems. Um, the things that you're getting through uh, claims data, like regular doctor's visits or things outside of the hospital, um, is that going into Salesforce at all, or is it just going to those other systems and Salesforce has some integrations well, with it? Well, Salesforce integrates the all of the information that comes in from the claims feed, so it works in our system. So it, it's the platform that our system is, is built on. Gotcha. And so my next question is, if slash when someday outpatient visits are all included in the ADT feeds, is that going to add value to what you're getting? Yes, because um, the, the biggest problem we have is everything that we get is stale from Medicare. And if um, there's a certain pattern that emerges, and um, okay, it's now June, I will get something in September or October on that. If a doctor is doing something or not doing something to go to that doctor in October and say, you know, back in June, you weren't doing such and such is not real effective. Um, they just, uh, first of all, if it was a real problem, they won't even remember. Let, let's say they did something, I don't know, that we think was against our protocol can't possibly know it. Um, the, the other thing is that um, we're really working on improving the transition of care, which really is important for high-risk patients. And um, we ask the doctors to report that to us. Of course, they don't, most of them. And when uh, we have access to their uh, EMRs, we kind of spot check some of them, but that's really labor intensive. If we had ADTs coming in uh, that was coded that it was a uh, transition of care, we'd be able to track that and jump on it when their 30 days have gone and they didn't do what they said they would do. That would be fantastic. Um, because the real time information is what's actionable. Stale information is not actionable. Um, so the more you can get us, the better it is. <laughs> so then as an ACO, do you, 
are, are, do you have incentives to help the individual POs set themselves up to begin sending the ADT to my hand? So, I mean, we, we have a couple of examples of POs who are going down that path, but you know, it's, it's difficult. Well, okay, but we're not a PO. We're, no, do, no do I know you're not, but the, uh, the, physician, the physician organizations we, that participate in their right, part Right, but yeah. we, I mean, we get the ADTs and we transmit information to each of the offices so every time somebody is admitted we notify the office right i i'm you know i agree with everything you said about the value in having offices who are not part of a health system send their adt up to my hand but there's yes. some there's barriers for them to do that and i was just curious what you thought about the aco's role in helping to mitigate some of those barriers or um not? as a practical matter the way it's set up i think it would be too expensive um, to, to get down to that granular level, but um, things keep changing and, uh, you know, new ways come up. Um, we have a lot of single one or two doctor offices. There, there is no way that they are easily in, in less, everybody agreed on an integrated EMR and we could send it from a central source. On the other hand, we have one, two, three practices that have over 40 doctors apiece, they could very easily um, send it to a central fort. And those three doctors would be about 30% of the ACL. So in, in that sense, um, yeah, I, I think we can, we can accomplish a lot even though it will be with fewer groups. No, I don't think we can get down to the individual level. Um, so, uh, one thing that you missed when Dr. Tim Pletcher spoke in the opening remarks was that one of the things we were, we're trying to uh, determine is if people who use Salesforce in healthcare are interested, if, if the costs are, uh, for Salesforce specifically, makes a big enough impact to you that you'd be interested in an economies of scale type pricing negotiation and, and group bargaining. Absolutely. Okay. I mean. That, that's a, of course. Okay, I, you, since you weren't here, I just wanted to mention that was one of the things that we're hoping to. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, one of, one of the problems that we're facing is um, for an individual ACO, Salesforce starts to get expensive on the storage, and our storage is gonna increase exponentially just because of the amount of information that is gonna be available, even if we don't increase the number of patients. Um, and Certainly, Blue Cross and the other payers are pushing everybody to integrate all of their patients onto one platform. Um, right now, that is cost prohibitive. Uh, but if, uh, as part of a group, that we could uh, make it cost effective, yeah, that's something we'd certainly participate in. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>